Of course, most of you have been on here with us, but for those of you who have not been on any of our Lunch and Learns yet, welcome and thanks for joining us. This is our workforce uh, Lunch and Learn, and it will go from 11 till 12.30. We do have two speakers with us today. One of them is Connections Area Aging, or I'm sorry, um, Area, what is, I'm sorry, Ashley? Connections Area Agency, Agency on Aging. Aging. I knew it was the three A's, and I was like, I'm missing it's a tongue twister. <laughs> I even yeah. almost flopped there. That's all right. <laughs> Connection Area Agency on Aging, Aging. Aging. Uh, is with us as our guest speaker, as well as Janine with Harms DNI program. All right. So our itinerary, I'm just going to go ahead and jump in, give you guys a quick background on our workforce challenges that we have that I think we've all probably discovered are not unique to Council Us, but it doesn't mean that they're not something that we need to look locally to try to address. Um, and then Drew Camp, our CEO and president, will give you an update on some chamber programs, maybe some legislative issues. Uh, I will then jump back in, just kind of give you some updates on some of the workforce programs that we are working on uh, and some things that we might have coming down the pipeline. We will then jump into our monthly speaker. And now that I have it in front of me, I could probably say it better. It's Connections Area Agency on Aging. <laughs> our guest speaker today is DNI Committee of Harm. Um, and then we will kind of wrap it up with any Q&A that you guys may have. So going right into this, um, the four areas that we found to be the, the tough trouble areas. So I guess a little bit of a backlog. In 2018, a group of HR managers locally got together and threw out some data provided by the state and some talent surveys uh, that they provided to business workers. They came up with four major areas uh, that are our challenges that we wanted to look at. First off, we want to reduce the turnover that our businesses are experiencing. At the current time, they were experiencing about a 33% turnover, which is quite high. Uh, we want to get that down to about 10%. We want to increase the number of individuals participating in the labor pool that were able to work. We were at about a 66%, which is still where we're about sitting, is about 66%. Uh, and the state's at 65% right now. So we're not doing terrible, but still we would love to see that around 80%. We wanted to increase brain gain. And so we discovered that those that are working um, in the workforce, uh, only 40% or less had secondary education beyond high school. So we wanted to see what can we do to help them either get a degree, get some um, secondary trainings or certification programs to help them along in their career path. And then we also want to increase the number of fully funded, funded apprenticeship programs that we have. At that time, we were less than 10%. That is what we are working on. So with that, they kind of came up with our ecosystem of things that they wanted us to work on immediately uh, that would definitely start to help some of those uh, challenges that we are facing. One of them is our lunch and learns that we've been having now since November. Um, and I appreciate all of you for joining us on those. The second set is we want to create some prof uh, professional development series, which we do have now. We are having those uh, quarterly for our leadership. We have those available for new leadership and also for our senior or C-suite leadership. We wanted to get our community work ready certified and that's through the ACT program. Uh, and we, we will chat about that a little bit further, but we are 99% of the way there now. So we're really excited about that. We wanted to create um, an employee satisfaction survey or best places to work program in Council Bless, and we were able to launch that this year. That was our unbelievable workplaces. Um, and out of the participants, we did have 16 awarded businesses in Council Bless for the first year that are unbelievable workplaces. Uh, and then we want to help promote work lab initiatives and the GROW program, Bridges Out of Poverty, and just what can we do as businesses to really help our workers so that they feel supported at work so that they don't have to leave their job or uh, have poor attendance due to their home life. So with that, I'm going to pause on our programming and turn it over to Drew Camp, our CEO. You want me to there? Okay, well, thanks, Alicia. I appreciate that. And thank you all for being here with us today. I just wanted to provide you a little bit of an update as to how things are going at the Council Bluffs Area Chamber of Commerce. And we talked a little bit, if you were on a little earlier, about uh, the reopening and things like that. But I did want to just provide an update on that. So we are formally re reopening the office on Monday, June 7th. Um, there's already some people, you know, transitioning back into the office just with the news that we've seen from the CDC over the last week, um, getting back in and just kind of like Alicia said too, getting that separation and back into the office into their own personal space. But we will formally have all six of our employees back in the office on June 7th, and then we will go back to doing some in-person meetings in the conference room as well. Um, and we're looking forward to being able to do that to get our team together in person. Uh, it's been interesting with myself coming on in August and then Alicia in September and Sarah Beth in November. 
Um, Sarah Beth has never been in the office. Alicia was in the office for all of about a week or two. Um, so it's going to be really good to get us all under one roof and the camaraderie and just the productivity, I think, uh, that'll help provide. With regards to our events, uh, what we're doing right now is really leaving it up to the host or the sponsor as to what they want to do and what they're most comfortable with. They still have the option to do it virtually if they would like. They'll have the option to do it in person if they would like. And then as far as the masks uh, usage goes, it's really personal preference. And that's what we're going to put out. If you're more comfortable having a mask on, that's perfectly fine. You can wear a mask. If you're more comfortable not wearing a mask, you can't wear, you don't need to wear a mask. We won't be checking vaccination cards. Uh, you know, that's just, uh, I will say that right off the bat. Um, that is something we're not interested in doing. Um, we know that we've seen the rates go up, but that is something I just wanted to address too, because I, I think you probably figured we wouldn't be doing that, but I just wanted to be very clear that there won't be that at all either. With regards with uh, workforce, as to things that we're doing here, I don't want to take too much of Alicia's thunder, but we're really doing some good things with the workforce development program, as you all know from being on these calls. But we did actually just last week go in front of the city council again to really talk to them about, you know, what we will be providing as part of our uh, $50,000 contract with them starting July 1st. And they were just really interested in learning more about that and the data that we're going to be able to provide as we continue to roll out some new surveys and some new data collection, uh, both metrics and then tools. Um, so that's something that we're really excited uh, to have that in mind. It's really important to have that public support, and we're really excited for that. We do have another event uh, that we're going to be doing here this fall uh, with the Business Ethics Alliance that's uh, with the leadership and professional development, development for more of the C-suite um, uh, level folks. So we're excited for that as well, and I'll let Alicia talk a little bit more about that because she did the, the legwork behind getting that uh, put forth and getting that put together. So I don't want to steal her thunder too much on that. Uh, we're doing a lot of other really good things working with, you know, the school districts, the community college. We've really enjoyed working uh, with uh, the new Kenny regime out at Iowa Western Community College. Uh, that's something that's been really, um, it's worked out really well over the first five months of this year since he started in January. And we really look forward to continuing to grow those collaborations as they kind of revamp their economic development ecosystem with Mark Stanley moving on and kind of look at what that looks like, both with the leadership, but then also just over all their operations and makeup. So that's an exciting piece as well. And then there's some changes at the school district that we're also working through as well with kind of the CTE uh, and the uh, career technical education. But we're really excited about where we're at with those things, especially in such a short time since Alicia came on in September and the fact that it was all virtually uh, and remotely uh, versus in person. So we're really looking forward to know that we'll be able to have an even bigger impact once we get back to being in person. With regards to policy, Alicia mentioned that. I won't go too far um, into that um, hole, so to speak, but, um, you know, the legislature did adjourn last night, and, and that was a very welcome piece of news just because uh, they needed to get out of that building and they needed to just be done so they could come back to their districts and we could start talking about some of the things they did right this session and then some things they need to be looking at doing better next session. Um, so that's something we're looking forward to talking with our Senator uh, Dan Dawson and then Tom Shipley as well, but then also Brent Segrist, Charlie McConkey, John Jacobson. If you don't know, Dan Dawson was an extremely busy gen, uh, individual this session. He runs the Ways and Means Committee. There was a ton of tax policy that went through, and that was really one of the biggest sticking points that kept them in three weeks longer than they were scheduled to be in. But they did get a lot of good things done with workforce housing. They expanded that. They paid off the backlog. That's now available to local communities to use for their workforce housing needs. They did some things with redevelopment. They did some things with mental health funding. They did a lot of different things with broadband um, as far as um, uh, providing grants for that and then putting in a new appropriations for it. They really did get a lot of good stuff done. Uh, they did also kind of wade into some of the other issues. Um, that are draw the ire of some. They got into some of the social issues that business groups sometimes have to stick their neck out and try to stop. Um, so that's something, one of the reasons why I say they needed to get out of that building is because the longer they stayed there, the more they might try to you know, pass some bills that may not necessarily help with our population growth and our workforce development. Um, so that's something we were really hoping that they would get done, but we are happy that they are done. We are happy that they got quite a bit of the priority legislation that we wanted to see them get done this year uh, done. And some pieces like the big tech censorship, which, you know, with Google being in our backyard with their larger, largest global data center, we were hugely opposed to that did not move forward. We were really happy about that. And then also tax increment financing did not happen either. So there's always those things we're happy to see, but also those things we're really, really happy not to see. Um, also at the federal side, there's a lot of things happening uh, there as well with the ARPA money, the American Rescue Plan money. That's something we're trying to pull our, our groups together the key stakeholders here in the community to really talk through what that money with the city and the county 
um, how that can best be utilized for the most return on investment, uh, bringing in all the, like I said, the partner organizations and stakeholders, that's been really big. We're also doing the same thing with the infrastructure conversations, and then also some of those pieces with the American Families Plan as well. There's also some things in there we don't necessarily love. Um, there's some things, obviously, with some of the tax policies uh, that are being quoted as part of those that aren't great for business. So those are things we have to watch out for, but we do love the talk of getting some additional investment into some of those key areas. And then with regards to business retention and expansion, uh, we're excited. Paula Hazelwood does have a new staff member on her team now and a project manager, um, and she's been very helpful uh, right off the bat in helping Paula and I set up meetings with our uh, local employers to get out and do our business retention visits. Really, really important to this group as well, because not only is it something that tells us when people are expanding or growing or if there's issues that need to be addressed, but it also largely shapes our workforce policy and our public policy piece within the chamber organization as well, because you can find out a lot of things in those confidential interviews that you put into the aggregate and then figure out things that need to be addressed on the policy or workforce side as well. The last thing I'll mention is with our diversity, equity, and inclusion pieces, uh, we're really happy with how things are going with the Executive Women's Partnership. We had our first event a week ago Monday uh, with Debbie Durham. She's the director of Iowa Finance Authority and the Iowa Economic Development Authority. And we had a really good group of folks, about 30 individuals uh, joined us. We were really happy with that turnout. Uh, and we continue to look at what we're going to be doing moving forward for that group to bring in more uh, professional development and training opportunities for the individuals involved with that. And the last thing I'll mention is the Women Inspiring Women event. I believe Kim now has about 350, 360 individuals receiving those updates. They are looking at planning an event here in July. Um, the steering committee is getting together to plan that. They did one back in April that was based on work-life balance. So we really look forward to what they're going to come up with for the July event as well. And we will make sure we share that information as soon as we can. The last thing I will end with is we are also excited that uh, we are going to have a candidate academy for any individuals who may be interested in running for local office, whether it's this November or some other time down the line. Um, so we are excited to be able to offer that at the end of June through August. So that's going to be a really, really good resource as well for our members as they look to try to learn a little bit more about what it may take to become an elected uh, official or how to run a campaign to become an elected official. So we're really excited not only to get back into the office, but can to continue to provide some really good resources and continue to grow our programming for our chamber members. And with that, I will turn it back over to Alicia. Thank you so much, Drew. I really appreciate all the information that you shared with everybody and kind of touching on some of those programs that we have available. Um, as Drew said, we really do have um, quite a number of new programming coming into the pipeline uh, for workforce. And that does include, just as you mentioned, working with businesses directly, creating professional development opportunities, apprenticeship opportunities, working to um, get those that are under underemployed employed, and then working with the school systems, of course. How do we get our students into the workforce now, kind of give them the opportunity to explore what those career sets could look like, what paths that they need to take uh, to go on those careers, and then also what do we do to keep them here, right? We don't want them moving off when they leave because they don't feel that there um, is opportunity for them in Council Blast. There definitely is opportunity, and we want to give them the opportunity to explore that uh, and to really dig their feet in. So the first thing that we're going to chat about is just an update on the ACT with the recognized businesses. We'll chat a little bit about our professional development opportunities, our apprenticeship programs, and then I just want to give you some updates on our job board. Um, and because I don't have a slide for the job board, I'm just going to start off with that because I know me, I'll forget and we'll move on and I'll never talk about it. Um, so our job boards, I just wanna remind everybody on here, if you do have a job available, please feel free to post that on our job board. Our job board is a benefit of being a member. Uh, so you can post as many jobs as you want and keep those open as long as you would like. We were able to add some filtering options to that job board. So you now can indicate if this is a full-time, a part-time, or a work from home opportunity. You can also indicate if it's a seasonal opportunity. And then once again, because we really are trying to work with the teenagers in the community, we now have that available as well. So if this is a teenage friendly position, you can indicate that and you can indicate the age uh, range that you hire from starting from 14, 15 through 19. That's an option for you to indicate what starting age you will take applications for those positions. And then because we are pushing that apprenticeship program, we all know that there are pre-apprenticeship programs with our teenagers that are still in school. Our apprenticeship programs are registered apprenticeships and our interns. So that is also now another subcategory. If you have an, a, an internship or apprenticeship program that is available, you can indicate that and put that right on there on our job board so that they can apply for you or apply with you through your link. Um, and so I also encourage you, if you've not done so, jump into the back of your house into your chamber uh, membership account and update your company listing. 
we really do get quite a few uh, website views per month. And the more robust that your listing is, the better it's going to be for you in either obtaining business or getting new associates to come join your team. You can add your logos. You can add all of your social media. You can add videos, photos, all of your staff you could add. You can add their bios. So it really gives you an opportunity to showcase your business in the light that you wish. So I encourage you to do that as well. It really helps, especially if you have job openings. When they click on your job name, it takes them to your listing on our website. Uh, it shows them kind of what it looks like to work for your company or the culture might be there at your organization. Um, along with the job boards, so we do have a weekly e-newsletter that goes out to job seekers. The job seekers are subscribers, so they are actively looking for a new job. And so the weekly newsletter has some educational opportunities, some training opportunities. It does have a link to our job board, as well as our um, our job seeker resource page. And then at the very bottom, we've got an opportunity for you to share any of your flyers that you have. So if you have a hiring flyer, or if you're doing a job fair, if you're doing a drive-through uh, interview session, please share those flyers with me in the link that you want me to hyperlink that flyer to. And we will put that in the newsletter. Those go out every morning or every Monday morning at 9 a.m. So if you can just get me that flyer by the previous Friday, I'll make sure to get you included. So now we're just gonna chat a little bit about um, are uh, ACT, so Work Ready Communities. For those of you that are not familiar with this, Work Ready Communities uh, works to make sure that we have the opportunity to hire the right associate right out of the gate. So they get what they call the NCRC, which is International Career Readiness Certification. These workers go and take this test. It's about a three-hour test, and it gives them uh, testing in three skill set areas, and then it gives you a score in each one of those skill sets. If you decide that you want to become uh, to support this organization and become a recognized business, you can do job profiling on your business and know exactly where your candidates should lie in each of those three areas. So it really does help you know that right out of the gate, your associates going to have the soft skills or or the simple basic skills, math applied, you know, documents finding documents, following directions, et cetera, that they need in order to le learn the skills of your job. So as you see, we definitely have the workforce ready to go. Um, they have got their NCRCs. And the only thing that we have left over here is to get enough employers. So we are currently sitting at 92 employers and we need 128 employers and become a work ready community. One of the best parts about being a certified work ready community is the data that we'll receive from ACT. It will allow us to see where the bulk of our NCRC holders sit as far as their skill levels and where the requirements for our jobs sit so that we can kind of see if there's a gap in between there. Then we can work with the school systems and the colleges to make sure that we have our programs that are available to get our workforce to the level that we need them to be. And so at this time, I do want to just launch my first poll here. Um, and so I'm going to give, leave that up for you guys for a few seconds. And it's just asked if you are currently a registered business for the Potawatomi County's work ready community. And if you're not, are you willing to show your support? Um, this is anonymous. So I won't, you know, see if you aren't willing to show your support here. Um, but I can also send you a link and I will actually put that up in the chat right now. If you are willing to show your support, there's a quick Google Doc that you can fill out for me. And inside of that Google Doc, we'll just ask you kind of your company name, what your industry is, and some contact information. And then I can actually go in for you and register your business. Once I get your business registered, um, ACT, the ACT will send you actually some best practices on how to hire right from the beginning and how to best utilize this tool. Again, this is a free tool. There's no cost to you to utilize this. Um, it is provided by the state of Iowa. So we are one of the lucky few. Um, our IWD takes the test for us. Um, they give the NCRC test out and so do our school system. So we're really lucky that we have quite a few individuals in our workforce that already have a certification. And it's a great way for you to just know if they put on their resume that they're an NCRC holder, that you can actually use this to make sure that they're qualified for the position you're hiring for. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and end that. I really appreciate it. I see that there are some individuals that are willing to jump in and show that support. Um, so hopefully we can get over that threshold by the end of the month. And so moving on to our next topic here is our professional development series. And I apologize if you see me moving around, I'm just moving everybody's head so I can see my screen. Um, so our professional development workshop series, according to a recent poll provided by Gallup, they surveyed over 1 million workers and 75% of those workers said that they left their job, not because of the position itself, but because of the management that they had. 
Um, and so I don't know about you guys and I don't know if you want to raise your hand, but who's ever quit a bad boss, right? Like <laughs> that happens. You might go somewhere else that exactly like somewhere else. It's very similar work. Maybe it's completely different, but you're like, you know what? I just, life's too short to be in that position, right? So we did create some professional development workshop series to really help our leadership and council bluffs. I don't know how many of you, and I know I've been one, right? Where I've been a super worker. And so then I become a supervisor and nobody gave me any training on how to lead people. And so I think that there are quite a few individuals and council bluffs that have been put into that situation. And so we do have professional development workshop series for our new and emerging leaders. And it really goes through the fundamentals of how do you lead your team productively and make sure that your team feels supported and that you're the one seeing the bigger picture, but they're feeling that you support them and that you really care about them and helping develop their skill set. The next professional development workshop series that we're going to have available um, is actually going to be available starting in September 29th and 30th. It's a two day workshop from 12 to 4 and that is our next level leadership. And this workshop is really designated for like our C-suite leaders, our executive leaders, senior leaders. I like to call them our seasoned leaders um, or our VPs. If you are a top tier leader and you really think that, you know what, I need to look at what my leadership skill is. What kind of influence do I have, right? What level of influence do I have on my team? Um, and how do I advance to that next level of leadership? This is the course that you're going to want to sign up for. So day one really will dive into what kind of influence you have as a leader currently and what you can really do to take yourself to that next level. Day two is going to look at those leaders that you're leading and what can you do for them as a leader to really gauge what uh, level they're at and help them also come up to that next level. So it's going to be a great workshop. This, again, is in partnership with Business Ethics Alliance. Uh, we've been working with them quite a bit on these series. Uh, and Casey is our, um, he's a facilitator and he's doing a great job. And so everybody seems to really enjoy going to his classes and we're happy to work with him again. And so, um, oh, I apologize. I'm, I'm going too fast here. Uh, let me exit out of this here so I can go back. That's going to bring us to our guest speaker, which is going to be correction area aging agency on aging. <laughs> and we actually do not have Kelly with us today. We have Aubrey and Ashley. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to them and they're going to share some information with you. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. Hi, thank you. And thank you so much to Alicia for getting us the information we needed to be able to do this presentation today and to be comfortable with it. Thank you so much. Um, as you said, I am Aubrey Kruger Kachera, and I'm so happy to be able to be here today and sponsor today's Workforce Collaborative Lunch and Learn. And to tell you about connections, our core services, including our older worker employment program, and how Connection is working to build communities of strength for older Iowans and their caregivers throughout our service area. Um, after I talk a little bit about Connections, I'm gonna turn it over to Ashley and she's gonna to talk to you guys more about the Older Worker Employment Program and how the program and all of Connection services can benefit you personally and as an employer. Connections is a private nonprofit um, we're designated by the state of Iowa as an area agency on aging and as an aging and disability resource center. Um, and our charge is to address the needs and concerns of older persons, people over 18 living with a disability and their caregivers. We serve 20 counties and have offices in Council Bluffs, Creston and Sioux City. Just a quick FYI, Every county and every tribunal council in the United States is covered by an area agency on aging. And we all have five core services that are outlined by the Federal Older Americans Act that we have to do for older Iowans and their caregivers. Some of the roles of the area agencies on aging are to assess community needs, and develop the funds and programs um, to respond to those community needs, um, educate and provide direct assistance to consumers about available community resources, and serves as, we also serve as portals to care um, by assessing multiple service needs, determining eligibility, and authorizing services. And then finally, uh, as anybody who receives um, federal funds, we have to demonstrate responsible fiscal stewardship. 
Um, just a quick stat for you. In 2020, around one in six Americans were age 65 and greater, and they can expect to live 19 and a half more years. Most older Americans live independently in traditional communities in their homes. And when asked, 90% of adults say that they hope to stay at home for as long as possible, but to do so, many people will eventually need some level of service or support to live safely and successfully in their home and community. The five core services that I talked about earlier are elder rights, services for family caregivers, nutritional programs, um, and that includes like Meals on Wheels and our congregate meal sites, health and wellness programs, and supportive services. Connections coordinates and offers home and community-based services that help our older islands to remain in their homes, aided by the services such as Meals on Wheels, homemaker assistance, and whatever else it might take to make living independently a viable option. We have a range of programs and services available, making it possible for older Iowans to choose the services and living arrangements that suit them best. I would be remiss if I didn't talk about the pandemic. Um, that changed the way we did services, as I'm sure it did for all of you guys. We had to think fast, and kind of pivot to make sure that we were serving our vulnerable islands and getting them the nutrition and services that they needed to shelter in place during and throughout the pandemic. We were able to quickly close our local meal sites and get delivered meals out to all of our meal site participants and to the folks that were already receiving home delivered meals. And since last March, I believe we are at about 800,000 frozen meals that went out to older islands so that they did not have to leave their home to go to the grocery store so that they had the food that they need to be at home safely. We were also lucky to have the support of technology <laughs> to be able to work from home and continue to provide all of our services to the seniors that we serve without them knowing any difference. The only thing different is that their service navigator, their case manager, or their older worker specialist would not come out and see them face-to-face. -face. Visits are done either over the phone or on Zoom or other virtual platforms. As things are starting to get better and we are really happy to be working on our plans to open back up in the next couple of months. We'll be returning to our offices and reopening our local meal sites. Uh, one of the things that I get to do at Connections is work with our advisory council. And <laughs> every meeting our advisory council members ask me, when are we reopening the meal sites? And all I can tell them is, you know, the state's working on a plan to make sure that you're safe. And we are currently working on that. Um, so very excited to get that going so that folks can get back out to the meal sites and socialize with their friends. And as we start heading back to the office, we are also looking forward to embarking upon fiscal year 22 and starting our new four year area plan on aging and continuing to serve older Iowans and their caregivers. A few highlights of the core services that we have at Connections is we have our elder abuse prevention and awareness program. Through this program, you know, we work to educate the public on what elder abuse is, how to spot it, how to prevent it early. And we also have services for folks that are either experiencing abuse or at risk of experience abuse. Most of the times these folks don't fall under the dependent adult abuse law, but they still need services to make themselves safe and to be able to stay at home independently. Coming up in June, we have World Elder Abuse Awareness Day on June 15th, and I am so excited with our plans for this year, and we hope to get all of you guys, our community partners, involved in raising the awareness of elder abuse so that we can help to make that less and less of a problem. Um, our elder rights specialist, Tasha Jones, 
is working on a plan and she is going to be reaching out to the chamber and to local businesses. And we really look forward to that. As I mentioned earlier, our local meal sites. Um, we are so excited to be in the process of opening up our meal sites and kind of changing the way that people think of meal sites. Like my mom's 65 and I know she wouldn't go eat at a senior center, but if we had yoga and other things like that, that might involve her, maybe she would go and grab a sandwich and do yoga and leave. And so we are looking at reframing our meal sites to make them more social multi-purpose centers. And we're very excited to see how that rolls out in the next four years. We are working um, to get evidence-based programs out there for older adults and their caregivers. Um, we're working on a plan to offer educational and fun programs to older Iowans and their caregivers. Um, right now we're doing our caregiver um, workshops virtually and we've been doing that for about a year now and it's been going so well. And we're gonna start some of our balancing, um, I'm sorry, it's matter of balance program and some chronic disease prevention programs as well soon. So very excited about that. We offer a family caregiver program offering supports to caregivers that are caring for an older adult, helping them to stay at home or also for grandparents age 55 and older that have custody of their grandkids and need some supports and services. Um, I think a lot of times people don't realize what it means to be a grandparent raising grandchildren, trying to live off your social security and caring for kids, it's not easy. So it's so exciting that we're able to have some services and supports for those grandparents so that they can continue to raise their grandkids and their grandkids don't have to go into the system. Um, in November is Family Caregiver Month and we are working on planning a conference for Family Caregivers Month. So please be on the lookout. This is gonna be for employers and for family caregivers and anybody who just wants to learn more about supports for family caregivers. So we will have that information getting out soon. One of the biggest services that we have at Connections is our information and referral. If you or a loved one ever has any questions about aging services or what might be available, you can call us. And all of the gals that answer our phone um, through information and referral are certified and they will get you the information they need, you need, or <laughs> they will find it for you. Along with our information and referral, some of the other services we have is service navigation. And the service navigation encompasses our option counseling sessions and our case management, which is working with seniors to identify what needs they have to remain independent in their home. And option counseling is more short term. We go in, we identify the need, help them meet that need, and then we're done. And case management's more long-term. If you have somebody who has more complex needs, we do have case managers that can work with them on an ongoing basis. With our case management program, um, the folks have to be 60 or older, they have to live in Iowa, and they have to need two or more personal care, such as bathing, dressing, or grooming. I have been with Connections since 2004, and these new, new, to, new programs that have come out in the last five years, I'm gonna talk about a little bit, because they're really exciting and they really help to meet community needs. One of the big ones that started in Council Bluffs is our Care Transitions Program, um, helping with people who are frequent flyers at Methodist Hospital. So you have somebody who's going into the hospital a lot and they found that lots of times those people don't have any support. So we have care coaches that can work with the folks that are 
coming in and out of the hospital to make sure they have the supports that they need to be successful at home and stop the recidivism from going back into the hospital. We um, have benefits counseling, which is very nice because lots of times people are eligible for services that they don't realize that they're eligible for. So it never hurts to look and see what you might be eligible for. I know lots of times people are really proud and they, they don't want help, they don't want welfare. And from the time when I was out um, working as a case manager with our elder abuse program, you know, our gals and guys do an awesome job of letting the older consumers know that, you know, these services are there for you. They aren't welfare. They are there to support you. You worked your whole life. Let's see what is out there that you're entitled to that can help you to live independently in your home. In Potawatomi County, we have a couple of very nice programs. Um, one is our SOS program, our solution options for seniors that can help seniors um, make needed home repairs that they don't necessarily have the funding for. Um, some of the things that we've done there is we had a gentleman that had some plumbing problems and we were actually able to work with the city and split the cost through our SOS program and through the city program to help him get his sewer pipes fixed because there was no way that he could afford the $15,000 that it was gonna cost to afford that. So that's the kind of things that our SOS program could do. We had a gentleman who um, was financially exploited by his caregiver and she took his inheritance that his mom left with the house um, and to weatherize it. All he wanted was new windows and to weatherize his house. And we were able to help him with that. And that was just very nice. I love the SOS program. I was the one who got to start it. So it is one of my personal favorites and it does great things. Um, we are part of the HEAT team here in Council Bluffs, a housing and emergency assistance team. We have utility assistance provided through that program. And those funds are specifically for people 60 and plus. So anybody else who works in a nonprofit knows that sometimes it's really hard to get people the utility assistance because they're out of funds. They have to wait till next month or there's a waiting list. With our funds, since it's 60 and plus, we can usually get the folks in and get them assisted very quickly. In Council Blesses, we also have a community interventionist. Um, and I believe that started at, or is a partnership with the Potawatomi County Public Health, uh, where we, another kind of like with Jenny Ed and the people going into the emergency room, this is working with folks that maybe call 911 because they're lonely or because there's other things going on. We have a worker that can go out and work with those folks and kind of problem solve and hopefully make it so that they don't have to keep on calling 911 because they're lonely or for little things like that. And that's a collaboration with the law enforcement too, right? The council yeah. police department. Yep, it's the police department, fire, fire department, station. EMS. So any first responders that identify somebody who is maybe calling 911 who really doesn't need 911 services but could benefit for some home and community services. All right. Um, quickly too, we also, we contract with Iowa Legal Aid to provide legal services to low-income seniors 65 and older. Um, Ashley, did I meet, miss anything? Um, we have a question. Um, yeah. Have you ever thought about um, like a senior teammate program where volunteers sign up to go visit their senior weekly? So part of our, the connections programs and Aubrey knows more than I, we do have a volunteer sector. Um, Terry um, oversees that. 
Um, so we do programs like we have programs like reading buddies. So seniors get assigned a child within a school. Um, and I'm not sure how often they meet. Aubrey might know more details. Um, and then what are the other programs? I know there are, we do offer several volunteer programs. We do. In Pottawatomie and Mills County, we have the Retired and Senior Volunteer Program, and that does encompass, we have friendly visitors. But of course, this past year, you know, things have been not great. We haven't been able to go out and do face-to-face -face things. But we're also looking as an agency to expand our volunteering because we have 20 counties <laughs> and we're fun. Just because we're only funded for two counties doesn't mean that we won't replicate and do these services in other areas as well. So Ashley, thank you so much. I feel awful <laughs> that I left out our volunteer well, opportunity. Yeah, and it, that's because like, Connections truly is an umbrella program and your senior hub for um, all the essential needs to keep people independent. Um, so it is hard to name. And, and like I told Alicia before we started, I hope Aubrey is on because I don't think I would have done justice like that. So thank you. Um, oh, and they, so they did, she, and then Terry did transition with the volunteer because she started Pin Pal. I don't know if that was started before or after COVID, but anyway, she's, you know, still, you know, twerking things so that we can still be proactive with our seniors socially and whatnot involved in the community. Perfect. If you guys are looking for volunteers to help uh, like meet with or visit with seniors or the pen pals, uh, just so you guys know, and anybody else on the call as well, if your organization has any volunteer needs, you guys can list those. It's another benefit of being a member that we started about two months ago. There is now a volunteer page and you can jump right on there and list your volunteer opportunities. And that does live on side of our website. So uh, especially when things start to open up, or if you need new pen pals, it's a great place to kind of put that opportunity out there for residents looking for something to do. Looks like uh, Aubrey got that noted. Thank you. I did. I did. <laughs> and and um, she's only given me like seven minutes to talk. I'm I'm kind of happy, but like, <laughs> is it my turn, Aubrey? Yes, Ashley. Please tell us about the okay. program. And how I'm it Ashley. <laughs> I've been with Connections Area Agency on Aging uh, for about five years now. Pretty sure, yeah. Um, and I am the older worker employment specialist. Um. I, my referrals come from VOC Rehab, um, so I'm in collaboration largely with them and with Iowa Workforce Development and all the partnering workforce initiatives that we have out there. Um, I, I, you can always call me, though, if you have an individual that wants to work 55 and older with a disability um, and not in CSEP services can work with the Older Worker Employment Program, um, but you do have to go through VOC Rehab. Um, so the Older Worker Employment Program qualifiers, like I just said, 55 and older, um, disability, that is a barrier to employment. Um, and, and, and a disability doesn't need to be necessarily something dramatic, um, but let's be real, d depression, anxiety are real issues that people face um, and maybe don't, don't take as seriously as maybe some that someone's missing a limb or going blind. All, 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 so I use disability as a large frame. Um, so don't count yourself, anybody out to receive services from me because of that. Um, Voc Rehab will uh, go through that eligibility process with you. Um, while partner, while part participating in the OWEP program, uh, Voc Rehab and I can offer many innovative ways to introduce you to a potential workers. Um, I like to say kind of try it before employers get to try it before you buy it. And essentially, I'm weeding out um, the job candidates before they even get to you to make sure they have the, the skills that they that you want as a business. So I take the time to get to know each unique business, which includes the culture. Um, training programs can be designed to meet specific business needs, as well as customized according to the skill level of the trainee. Um, the OAP worker can review your needs, offer qualified candidates, and develop a training plan with you before the new trainee employee begins employment. Um, so it, it's like having an, an, an extra HR on your on, on your on board with you. Um, nonprofit, so it's no cost to have me involved. Um, so um, anyways, so the specialist will assist you with any questions you may have and provide technical assistance during training as well as follow-up services that you may need. Um, one of the great perks about the OWEP program is that unlike um, book rehab, we are able to follow along with the 
job candidate for a year after successfully finding their goal for employment, which means the businesses that I work with also have me as a continued support to work with the person for a year after they even close with Voc Rehab. Um, um, the, uh, any, like I said, any technical assistance and whatnot, understanding these critical pieces, we can make sure that your, our job candidates are trained in a way they best, they learn best and best serve your job needs. And like I said, it's a no cost service. Um, so, um, wow, I said that in a little, little bit of time because I talk fast, but um, so I'm just gonna now just talk. So um, the, the, the OWAP program has a double edged sword. So I, it's my goal to make business contacts and to help you as employers to get the right uh, job candidates for wherever your, whatever your skills are or whatever the business entails uh, but then you also have to remember that if you have a family member, a friend, an acquaintance, a neighbor um, who is 55 and older um, with some some maybe what they see as a disability to for them to secure employment, feel free to refer them to the OAP program to Connections or Voc Rehab to work with me. Um, the things that I help the job candidates with that prepare them for uh, businesses as, as resume writing, cover letter writing, um, making and advocating, like I said, with the businesses, um, applications, as we know, technology, most, um, I want to say majority of my pool of individuals are not so computer savvy. Um, so a lot of it's helping with the application processes and checking emails. I, I hate when I hate to have anybody miss the opportunity because they don't have the technical thing that the, the, the computer or, or, uh, you know, uh, uh, a phone that they don't really know how to work. So what I do is try to um, keep them updated as much as possible on what's going on. Um, any correspondence, especially um, emails and whatnot. And I think that's it. <laughs> I see something. Um, I shared you guys' information, your contact information. Okay. okay. Um, I've seen and talked probably most of you have seen me. So if you ever have any questions, feel free to email me. I'm sure it's in the server that Alicia, oh, she put the information in, let me know. But I am here to serve you guys as businesses to make sure that job candidates are placed at your location and, and placed with the skills that are needed to be successful. Um, I do a lot of mentoring, you know, especially with the pandemic and everything. And and, uh, you know, some of my individuals haven't worked like for him. years and years. What's that? It, and Ashley does such a good job of building confidence and inventorying skills to make sure that all candidates are placed in a successful employment situation. Yeah. And I do wear all hats. <laughs> so I help with housing because if you're not, if you're not comfortable at home and your home life is in disarray, it's going to be very difficult to maintain employment. And we all know that. And life throws us curveballs all the time. And so I, like I said, that mentoring piece is, is really huge. Um, I even just did a mock interview this morning with a lady and she did just fine. I'm like, you got this, you know, it's a lot of encouragement. Um, but I want businesses to know too, if there's hard conversations that need to be had and I have the trust with them, let me be involved too, because they might listen to, you know, the both of us per se. <laughs> Um, and that's all I got. So if anybody has any questions, you can always uh, use the contact information to get a hold of me or Aubrey, and we'd be happy to answer any anything that you need. Um, but yeah. So there was a question about if you could share a success story. Um, there's so many. Um, uh, gosh, um, I just had, I'm trying to think. Oh, I, I'll do a networking one. So Touching Hearts is a major um, a participant in a lot of the committees that I participate in. Well, because of the networking that we did with Touching, what I did with Touching Hearts, I have a lady that, you know, she still takes care of her son. Um, she has underlying health issues and the anxiety is really there. She only wanted to work one day a week, like Saturday, and that was it, um, because she's her son's transportation to and from work. So I connected with Touching Hearts and got her successfully placed. And she's working Saturdays now. And it's just, it's everything that she wanted. And 
I can help with the payroll and have that connection with Touching Hearts to do that too. Um, <laughs> Aubrey, you put me on the spot because there's so many. But Ashley too, you, she partners with um, employers across our 20 county service areas. Um, I know she has very strong partners in the Sioux City area and in yeah. County Bluffs and in Creston. Creston. Yeah, Atlantic I'm working on. Um, so, it, it, you know, ideally I like to reach out to an employer at least once a week, but I, I also participate in groups like this so that like touching hearts. I mean, that's, there's other people that I reach, Hey, you know, we heard you talk. This is what I need. Do you have anybody in your pool of, you know, pool of candidates? So Perfect. I'd be well, happy to help you. anybody. Thank you so much, Ashley. It's very exciting to have you guys on today. And, um, you know, when we talk about DNI, which I think this is a great like prelude right into our next conversation. Um, sometimes we forget that that also means people with disabilities. It means our seniors. It means people that maybe have been, really, have been incarcerated before. So really working on making sure that we are all inclusive and that we are working with everybody, especially right now when our labor pool is reducing and reducing. I was just on um, a call yesterday Day, guys, and 58% um, of millennials are working to become free landscapers or entrepreneurs. So uh, when you think about that right now being the largest generation pool we have in the workforce, and 58% of them are looking to become independent, that really does mean that the workforce pool is reducing, but it doesn't mean that our talent pool is reducing. Um, and so again, working with seniors is a great way to fill in some of those hours. Uh, and like Ashley said, Saturdays, I mean, you cannot get people that like willingly want to work Saturdays anymore, right? So right. it's a great, I encourage you guys, if you guys have any positions that you're having a hard time filling, that maybe can be part-time, that can be those entry-level positions, let Ashley know, let them help connect you. Um, I know that in my previous position at the hotel at Spring Hill Suites, I worked with Vodak. It was a great program. Um, it was amazing to have them come in and help fill in some housekeeping positions and some breakfast positions. They did an amazing job. And so I know Ashley working with them It'll be the same process and, and just a great way for you to uh, really expand your workforce and, you know, get a more diverse team um, on your field. And I don't know about you guys, but if you've never worked with a senior, they're a hoot. Like, it's probably my favorite age group to work with. The stories that they can tell you are super fun. Um, and so it's just a great way uh, to kind of look at look at that workforce. And ageism is so real in the workforce. And, and what I explain to businesses and the job candidates themselves, you have such a good work ethic compared to some of the youth, in my opinion, and so many tools up their sleeves that people forget about. Um, even compassion, compassion is huge with our seniors. So just remembering that they are an asset to our community. They are. <laughs> Thank you so much. And I want to thank um, Connection Agency, Area Agency. I'm going to get that one day. I am. <laughs> thank you guys for sponsoring us again. And at this time, I'm actually going to turn it over to Carol Horner, who is going to introduce our guest speaker. So it's my pleasure uh, to introduce Janine Scott. So uh, Janine is first my friend, but also a colleague and a uh, committee member. She and I serve on the Haram uh, the HR Association of the Midlands uh, Diversity and Inclusion Committee. We call ourselves the ideal champions. And, uh, and so she's been a, a, a big part of the kinds of programming that we do at, at Haram. And if you have, if you're an HR person or you have HR people that, that work with you, they should be members of Haram. It's a, it's a really important organization here in the Metro. But, so, but let me get to Janine. So she, currently uh, for a little while longer is going is the vice president of diversity and inclusion for for uh, uh, the Omaha Performing Arts. She has made it to the big time and she will be moving to New York City to to do uh, to be vice president of uh, I think they call that title right vice president of diversity and inclusion for a Broadway like like the Broadway um, which I know is uh, is a really just an incredible treat for her. Uh, she is a performer herself. So uh, I'm excited for my friend, but I will miss her badly. But I'm just going to turn it to you, Janine, so you could talk a little bit about diversity, equity, and inclusion and belonging. 
Yes, thank you, Carol. And I will miss you as well, especially all the little side jokes we got going. <laughs> Uh, so I'm going to, I'm not going to read the slide. And when I say, um, when I talk about diversity, I am being all inclusive. I am including people uh, who, who um, have a disability. I'm including people of all ages, which um, by law is anyone over the age of uh, 40 or 30. 40, 40, I apologize. And I'm including um, BIPOC people. That is that is people who are black, indigenous people of color and um, LGBTQ plus. Uh, if in this presentation I say BIPOC, I believe a rising tide lifts all boats. And so no one person is one thing alone. And so it, I did, it goes for any group of marginalized people. Uh, but I may refer to BIPOC or I may say she, and it does not mean that I don't think that men are capable of falling into that category of being in a protected class. Uh, let me go ahead and get started. So a few things that we're going to cover, I'm not going to read the slides. I'm just going to make an assumption that everyone is able to see them or, um, and if you're not, we will, um, I'm going to speak to the slide, uh, but I don't, I'm not gonna read them verbatim. Uh, we're gonna cover inclusive recruitment. We're gonna talk about steps to prepare a work environment, how to recruit diverse candidates and strategies to retain your diverse, can your diverse talent. Uh, so first of all, it's important to have an inclusive environment and to recruit in, um, from marginalized group because we serve a diverse group of people. Our employees are diverse, our vendors are diverse, our customers are diverse. We have diversity of thought and experiences that we bring to the table. So diversity already exists when we walk into the room because again, no one person is just one thing. Um, and not only that, it's important to, um, to have inclusive practice, inclusive recruitment uh, practices, because it builds your reputation as an organization, as a business of valuing differences. And not only that, it's the right thing to do. It's always right to be inclusive of all individuals, especially those marginalized groups. So before you start going out and recruiting people from these different sectors, you have to prepare your work environment. So that's training um, and Haram offers a lot of different types of trainings every month. Uh, it's implicit bias training, it's ally training. You can also get with consultants um, who offer these types of training. In the workplace, you can form a small committee or a task force or an employee resource group for that specific group. So for Omaha Performing Arts, we have something called the IDEA Committee, which is inclusion, diversity, equity and accessibility. And we talk about, um, we talk about all the issues, uh, whether it's LGBTQ and celebrating Pride Day, or if it's the uh, celebrating and purchasing um, a stage for uh, Cinco de Mayo and helping with the, uh, with the overall production. Uh, we don't wanna just be lip service. We wanna actually be doers when it comes to um, putting this type of committee forward and doing the work in our community. The other thing is you may want to create diversity goals to recruit for marginalized groups. So we say if we don't if it, if it doesn't if we don't write it down or what doesn't get measured doesn't get done, right? And so if you don't create a goal, then how are you going to be accountable for said goal? So creating these diversity goals and looking at, okay, how are we gonna approach this recruitment? What group are we missing in our workforce? And how are we gonna go about approaching these groups and establishing these relationships? In addition to that, you wanna develop and share out your report. A lot of the times we do the work, but we don't let the community at large know that we're doing the work. And so sometimes we are brought to task for things that we're already doing. And it's like, well, no, we're already doing that. But are you letting the community know that you're doing that? So if we set a recruitment goal, then I wanna share it out. I want everyone to know that this is a part of our recruitment goal and we are looking for these specific individuals to apply to join our workforce. And then those individuals will feel comfortable because they'll say, well, they want me. Because a lot of times people, especially people in marginalized groups, don't apply for those positions because they don't know that it's gonna be an inclusive work environment. And so they're just like, uh, 
I, I don't know. And I don't know if that's for me. I don't know if that environment is going to be accepting of me and who I am and what I bring to the table. So you wanna be able to share that information. You wanna use job boards and sites strategically. So if um, for, a, we have Inua, you know, which is a Nebraska Eastern Office of Aging, you know, you can, you can post jobs there. You can post jobs on the Urban League's Young Professional Boards if you're looking to attain more uh, black individuals. Uh, and looking at those partnerships, looking at those job boards and looking at where you're placing those positions and those openings are also gonna help you to recruit um, uh, more diversity in your work site. The training, the implicit bias and ally training, it helps you to one, establish a common language. We can all talk the same. And it's not like, well, what is BIPOC again? Or, you know, what does that stand for? We can all have a universal language that everyone can understand. Um, you look at the implicit bias in the hiring process. Look at the language that you're using in your position description. And then also, are you saying in your position descriptions um, that we, we support diversity, we believe in this, or is it just a generic position description? Are you using he slash she? And so what if someone doesn't identify as either? Then are you excluding them? So looking at your hiring process, looking at your position descriptions that you're posting, if you're doing panel interviews, does that panel represent the diversity that you have within your organization? Yes or no. And if there is no diversity in the organization, then maybe calling that out, especially to those candidates and saying, you know, we, we champion this, this is our uh, DNI plan, action plan, and sharing that information so that they understand that, um, you all are a work in progress. Ally training, calling in and calling out. If I'm in a meeting with um, with Carol and Ashley says something, you know, then you know Carol should be able to say, Ashley, you know that that made that made Janine and Wendy very uncomfortable. She should be able to have that conversation. And so, looking at trainings that uh, help people like Carol or anyone who's witnessing a microaggression to be able to call in or call out people without, um, without put, putting, um, putting people to task or uh, putting people on the defense. But we also have to look at what voices we center. Um, so it's, is it okay that uh, Ashley's like, oh my gosh, I'm embarrassed, I'm so sorry. Give her an opportunity to say, I didn't recognize that I had just done that and be forgiving. Sometimes we have to offer grace because we're gonna make missteps throughout this process. And so calling in and calling out allows you to give that person grace, give that person an opportunity to, um, to either apologize or to be educated. And it also lets someone like me know that I have an advocate and an ally in Carol. The, uh, the last part of training I would look at is creating programs that promote inclusion and belonging for all employees. And you can do this through your employee resource group. Uh, for example, we do book clubs at um, Omaha Performing Arts. And so we read a book together. We've read White Fragility. We are we just finished reading You'll Never Believe What Happened to Lacey, um, a story on racism. And so we read books together and then we debrief and we talk about it. and we've had some really vulnerable moments through those book clubs uh, across the board. And so just finding an opportunity just for your staff just to come together and to share and to grow will also help to deepen that um, inclusion bond. So find key staff if you're gonna build a small committee, find key staff or community or university stakeholders gather the data. You need to know where you are in order to know where you're going. You can't just make assumptions. There may be someone who identifies one way and all this time you thought that they identified another way. So we don't want to make assumptions. We want to get the data and then build our, um, our smart goals or our goals from there. Uh, you want to identify the areas of concern. Where are you lacking talent? Is your organization experiencing a brain drain? I'm just going along with the ageism that we're talking about. Are you experiencing a brain drain? Are your older individuals leaving um, and not passing on that knowledge? Or are your older individuals staying um, longer and passing on that knowledge? So you wanna know that. But again, you have to know where you're at by gathering the data. Do you have, do, do, are all of your C-suite individuals white men? 
Is there diversity? Is there a woman there? Uh, do you have anyone who identifies as having a physical um, disability? Uh, and did you ever have someone there and did they leave because they felt that the environment was not conducive uh, to, to accommodate uh, for their disability? So after you've gathered the data and you've identified those areas, you create your objectives and you outline areas to focus on recruiting women or people of color or individuals who may be, who may be seniored or who identify as LGBTQ. And then you charge the task force with creating these ongoing inclusion initiatives. So you're creating the goals to recruit marginalized groups. And if you are committed to recruiting people of color, you create a specific goal to support hiring from the BIPOC community, which means if you have two individuals applying for the same job and they all things are equal and your goal is to hire a person of color, then you hire the person of color if all things are equal. It's not tokenism because no one wants to be a token. You hire them because all things are equal except this one has this one thing that's gonna help you to achieve that goal. So for example, diverse candidates as of whatever percent of overall candidates. This is an example that Hilton restaurant brands made a commitment to, that they will have 50% of their candidates be diverse in order, for a, in order for a search to be deemed viable. So if they have less than 50% candidates, then the search starts over. And that's the same process that we use at Omaha Performing Arts, except we don't use 50% because we're not national. Uh, and so we only have a subsector. And our goal is, okay, we have about 30% people of color now at our organization. So we need to at least have, we think we're above average. So we need to have, you know, 30 to 35% people of color apply for a position and not just apply, but apply and be qualified. So again, it's not about numbers. It's not about ticks and things like that. It's about viable candidates. Another goal, uh, uh, VMware's uh, CEO committed on CNBC, no job hiring process will end unless a minority candidate is interviewed. These are goals that are made by large organizations. And so if these large organizations can do that, we can do that as well, because we have more of a connection with our community than some of these Fortune 500 institutions. Lastly, you want to share and you want to um, you want to develop your program, you want to develop your your goals, and then you want to share them out. Uh, if you look, we I talk about both Target and Uber, they share their data on the percentage of their employees who identify as people of color. Gathering similar data and creating comparison charts can help you identify with department, which departments uh, need more focus when it comes to recruiting uh, people of color, but you can put any marginalized group in there. It doesn't just have to be people of color, but I am specifically talking about people of color on this part, um, because again, a rising tide lifts all boats. Uh, diversity report is gonna help your organization become more transparent. And I think a lot of what's going on uh, right now is asking for more transparency when it comes to diversity, equity, and inclusion when we talk about our organizations and their commitment. Um, I've cited eBay's diversity report and Facebook's diversity report, both of which came out in 2020. eBay's came out in May 2020 and Facebook's came out in July 2020. Omaha Performing Arts has a page where we have our report so that people are able to click on it and they're able to see uh, where we were and where we're at and where we're going. Uh, lastly, talk about postings. We talked about job boards that include um, different websites that support um, diverse candidates. Create an EEO statement for your job postings. Make sure that it's posted and that it's present. We all have to adhere to it, but it doesn't hurt to post it and to include it. We have a diversity statement that goes on every position description. It says that you will uphold our core values of team, trust, inclusion, and inclusion would be our DEI things, so, and integrity. And if you, you have, you must have a demonstrated proven commitment 
to upholding these types of goals. And so then in the, um, in the hiring process, we ask about different things. So for example, we're hiring a marketing individual and I'm, I ask, what connections do you have with niche media? And how do, you con how do you grow those connections? And how do you go about making those connections? So there's always a way to include it, um, even in finance. Are you looking at the budget to see if we said we were gonna spend 10% of our marketing dollars in with niche media, are we doing that? Finance is then able to hold us accountable. So it's every department, it's not just one person, it's across the entire organization. And that's just one way that you can work that into the position description and into your overall company culture. The last thing is, again, you wanna look at your language. You wanna make sure you're not unintentionally leaving someone out. Are you using a person or one, or are you saying he or she instead of this person or this position? The last thing we want to do is we want to hire and we want to retain them. Panel interviews are great in some areas because especially if your organization has diversity, you can show them visually without even saying anything. You can show them your commitment to diversity. You want to set interview questions kind of like what I use as an example for marketing. You want to question your own self on your biases. You, you know, did someone say inadvertently um, talk about their child in an interview? Don't go down that road with them. One, it's illegal. But so don't go down that road with them. But then do you start to say, well, we have events at night and this person said that they had a they had a son or a daughter. And then you start making excuses as to why this person isn't good for this position. Um, that's not your place. If they thought that it was an issue, then they wouldn't have applied. Uh, so you move forward and don't worry about any of that extra stuff. And again, you know, if Carol says something and Ashley, Ashley can call Carol out and say, you know, that's a bias. I, you know, and, 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 and that, that doesn't have any place in this review process. And so again, it goes back to that allyship training, being able to call people in or call them out. And then it goes to that hiring with intentionality, which we talked about. If you have two people who are equally qualified and one helps you to meet said goal, then you go with that individual that's going to help you meet that goal. And lastly, you use that, um, you utilize that small committee group that you have to help to continue and reinforce your inclusion trainings. And your employees are always going to be your best recruiters. That's why they give pensions or stipends to um, employees who recruit staff because typically friends want to be around other friends. But that is also a slippery slope because most of the time our friends look like us. And if we really want to create diversity, we have to, we have to then call out that bias as well. I, I know I kind of flew through, but I wanted to give time uh, for questions. Uh, I have so, one. Yes. Um, well, helping people fill out applications, how would you recommend wording when asked gender? I say, do you identify as a male or female or prefer not to? The word identify has been questioned in a previous forum. So I was wondering your perspective on how to ask that questions. Cause even I, you know, seniors aren't immune to being, um, affected by racial and and gender and equal inequalities so right. how would you propose that i ask them that question uh, yeah you can you're talking about well do you have to ask it i guess that's one is it is it necessary to be asked no no i mean it's so, really not I mean, so what's the i guess my thing is what's the rationale if is it helping you to meet a goal or are you just asking just to ask because it this says is, your name this is on employment applications oh and, well there's always an option to not respond but but i because we're virtual right now and i do a lot of the legwork the computer side i have to say what's the app on the application per se there, and so I want to I want to take initiative to word it correctly even if maybe the business didn't right there should always be an option though for a little box that says opt out if that person doesn't feel comfortable but if, if I have to ask to, that how do you ask it if, yes, if you so. have to ask it then you just then then you say yeah you ask them how how do they want to be addressed yes what, Carol what Ashley's asking is she's she's speaking to a senior 
and having to fill this out for them. Okay. It says that she doesn't have any control over that. How does she say it to the seniors so not to bring that them not to be in there? Just just say what are your pronouns? Okay. And then if what they are ask your preferred what pronouns, she just say she, he, okay. they, them, and you can list them. But I would just say what are your preferred pronouns? Thank you. Yeah, I would think that if somebody has one that's not like a she or he, like they, they are very well of what their pronoun is. And if you say that, that they will yeah. know. Okay, that helps a lot. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. You know, the, the one thing I, I forgot to mention about Janine was that the Haram has a an awards program called, called the Ideal Awards. And Janine's work that she did at Omaha Performing Arts won one of those awards last year. So um, what she's sharing with you is, is industry best practices by far. Janine, I would love to um, do a follow-up with everybody on the call. And I know that some individuals unfortunately had to jump off, um, and uh, but they were interested in the work that you're doing. Do you have like maybe a one pager or any of the information that you shared in the slides that I can share with them just so that they can start to look at like, how do we actually implement a DE&I program in our business? How do we set goals? How do we hire correctly? Um, so that I can share that information out to our HR managers. Yeah, you, you certainly can. I mean, even the, the presentation itself, you know, kind of walks you through with, you know, how to how to go about it. You know, it talks about the different trainings that you need to have. It talks about how to get your employees involved. I can certainly, well, I actually, I think you do have the presentation. <laughs> you got that to me, so if you're okay with me sharing that, I would yeah. love to send that and as a follow-up. Yeah, and there are links in there where people can click and, and see what Facebook's overall thing, uh, or eBay's overall commitment, or Uber, um, or Target. So there are links that are embedded in that presentation where they can click and they can they can look for reference. Uh, it says uh, Lori has a raised hand. I don't yeah, know. Lori Lynn. <laughs> oh. And Lori Lynn has her face on now, but we can't hear you, Lori Lynn. <laughs> There we go. Okay. I'm just heading in to go get my grandson, but I'm so glad I have a chance to talk to you. We are going to be working on this at Shannon Claren Pace. How can we avoid what happened in Nebraska Shakespeare? They did a statement. They were very um, transparent. It seemed like the timeline is how they got in trouble and now they have, they're canceling and it became a Facebook storm. How can we avoid that? And this might be a longer conversation than I well, <laughs> Yeah, and I'm very familiar with, with, the, with, the, with the blowback. Um, I think one is to make look and see who's in the room and make sure all voices are in the room when crafting said statements and then addressing it all, you know, or saying, you know, putting out a statement saying that there'll be more information to come and put a deadline on it and say this is okay. what, and, and, and so that there's some accountability. No one expects that you, you wake up and then all of a sudden you're gonna have this DNI plan and it's gonna be 100% great and all the, all the rights of the world are gonna, you know, all the wrongs of the world are all of a sudden gonna be right. We recognize it took years to get here and it's gonna take years for us to get past here. And so we're always gonna be continually paying catch up. Um, and I think that we all recognize that. And I think being transparent in, in saying that and saying it's gonna take time, but we are looking. We are looking for individuals to help us to build. I think we can all agree on one thing that inclusion and creating inclusive practices are, are paramount to who we all want to be, not just as an organization or a business, but who we all want to be as a people. And so if you yes. can establish that right there, there's a there's a framework to build. Okay. Right? So you gotta establish a solid foundation first. So find, find the ground, and even if it's the lowest ground possible that you can meet on, meet on that ground and build up from there. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah. So, okay. Yep. Yeah, because I'm, we're looking at that going, hmm, how do we avoid what, what were their pitfalls? And so we're going to get yeah, some Well, they didn't have too, the people so. in the room. They didn't have the, they didn't have everyone in the room. Okay. That was number one. That's all number right. One. Thank you. No Thank problem. you so much. Mm -hmm. <laughs>
And Lori, Lynn, I know that you're in your car, but I can send this information out um, in my follow-up to everybody, but their harm does have some information on their website as well. And Carol was talking about inclusive communities. Uh, I can share that with you as well, because those are good places to start just to make sure that you've got the information that you need to kind of start to build that foundation. Yes, we are having inclusive communities. We have like six trainings coming up that Dana organized. So, yeah. And I, I'll, I'll be getting... Uh, a list of some other uh, contractors out there that, that can help you with some of the reviews of the, the um, resumes or reviews of the uh, job descriptions and job postings and stuff like that to help you with the language stuff if you want if you want to uh, access them. Uh, also, if you go to the Haram website, um, uh, which is just haram.org, H-R-A-M.org, you can, uh, we have a resources page there for diversity. Uh, it, it needs it needs some serious updating because we've been kind of lagging behind on some of that, but we're getting we're getting, um, we're getting a lot done there. Also, if any of your people are members of SHRM, the the Society of Human Resource Management on the national level, uh, their together uh, together at work uh, program, um, which is their DEI focus, is really um, incredible. It's a good good uh, Thank good you. good fair amount of resources there too. And if anybody needs to reach out to me, I, you know, I have a lot of contacts in this area, uh, and I'm happy to to refer you to some folks that can that can help you with whatever you're you're working on. Just just work on it. That's the important thing. Exactly. <laughs> Well, Janine, I really appreciate you coming today um, and sharing this information with us. I think it was a great layout, some great starting places for everybody if, if they haven't started somewhere. And um, I really I really appreciate you coming today. That was a great PowerPoint presentation. If anybody doesn't have any other questions, I think we'll kind of move into the wrap up here um, of our meeting today. Um, again, I want to thank everybody for coming with us and sitting. I know everybody's getting zoomed out. And so I am excited to announce that much as Drew mentioned earlier, uh, because of the new CDC regulations, we are moving back to the office. Uh, I know that there are so many people in our community that are really supportive of getting vaccinated and making sure that they're doing their part uh, to stop the pandemic um, and slow down COVID-19. And so we're excited to announce that we will be going back to in-person lunch and learns. Um, next month, we are going to do our last one virtually. Uh, we already have that planned out. And I think that this gives everybody time to get prepared to go back to being in person um, and to gauge what their comfort levels are with being in person as things start to open back up. Uh, yes, Ashley. Um, I'm not so sure what my travel forecast is. <laughs> so I just was curious if you could do both in person and Zoom. Yep. So, so that if um, I'm out of town and I'm able to hop on, we recently purchased an owl, um, and I have no idea. I didn't even know what that meant. At first, I was like, oh, I love owls. They're so cute, but why? <laughs> I was yeah. like, what? I'll be a positive. We didn't purchase an animal, so what are we talking about? <laughs> um, so we do have an owl, um, and I will hopefully be recruiting uh, a coworker that knows how to use the owl uh, to join me on those in-person lunch and learns that we're there. We can make sure we have both platforms available for everybody. Uh, I know that some businesses are still not allowing their associates it's in person. I know that just like today, um, it's so easy to book yourself back to back, right? And so it's going to take a whole nother curveball, like, right? We didn't get used to doing that overnight. We're not going to get used to giving ourselves travel time and break times uh, in between meetings. And so people might go, gosh, I really wanted to go to that lunch and learn, but I totally forgot and booked a 12 o'clock or a 1230 right up to this. So we definitely want to have that available for you guys. Once again, uh, when you register, um, please make sure that you register and you will receive the information of what the location is going to be, or you'll receive that, that option for a Zoom link. Moving into the in-persons, there will be a minimal fee of $10 per person because it is a lunch and learn, and I don't want anybody to get hangry. We will be feeding you at all these locations, and so we are able to decide who will be or won't be in person, so we do just have to say, okay, this is the registration number. This is the number of lunches I need, so we just ask that $10 to help cover those costs. So, um, yeah, that's all that I really had for you guys. I 
hope that you guys continue to join us. If you guys have anything that you're like, gosh, Alicia, you know what? I'd really love to learn about this, or I would love a follow-up to the D and I conversation or a follow-up to, um, you know, two weeks ago or two months ago, we have this uh, presenter. Can you do another follow-up to that? Let me know. We definitely want to make sure that this is something that is beneficial to you um, and that you are actually getting pieces of information, professional development tools, resources, et cetera, that will help you with your workforce and making sure that we have a robust uh, community. So with that, uh, I will close it unless we have any other questions. Hi, everybody. Good luck to me in New York. I'm so Thanks jealous. Me. How exciting. <laughs> like, congratulations. I, I, I'm, I'm trying to decide how I'm going to, like, your business need to do as far I just as added her on or Facebook. whatever in order to get tickets. <laughs> I just, I just <laughs> added you. <laughs> Okay. I, just, I just added you on Facebook, Janine. So if you see okay. Ashley Parker, that's me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to get a group tour to New, to New York just to come see you, Janine. We're like, here she is. That's <laughs> fine. I welcome, I welcome some Midwest love. Yes. Awesome. <laughs> oh, Goodbye, everybody. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Bye, guys. Bye. Thanks.